Okay, hi everyone. Um, I might just give another moment or two. There seems to be people streaming in. Okay, so we might start off. Welcome to everybody on the webinar and welcome to Connecting with Nature. Um, firstly, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I'm joining this meeting from the lands of the Gadigal people, the Aura Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of various lands from which we gather today. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So this is an exciting event as it's the inaugural event, for the Urban Bushland and Waterways Group, which is part of the Sydney branch. It's a newly reforming group. Um, so that's what makes it doubly exciting. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded onto the National Parks Association of New South Wales website, where you can also catch up on previous events or listen to those that you really liked again. If you have any questions during the event, please just use the Q&A or the chat session and um, we'll address those probably at the end of the presentation. So, as our first event, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. John Turnbull, who will introduce us to the hidden habitats of underwater Sydney. Dr. John Turnbull is a marine ecologist, social scientist and passionate underwater photographer. He's dived extensively around Sydney and elsewhere in Australia and knows the inhabitants of these waters extremely well. A few years ago, John traded a life as a business consultant to pursue a passion for marine conservation and is currently a researcher at the University of New South Wales working on environmental stewardship and sustainability. His current fieldwork includes biodiversity surveys along the east coast of Australia and monitoring soft corals and seashore pop, sorry, seahorse populations in Sydney. John's the co-author of the book Underwater Sydney published by the CSIRO and he's published several academic papers and is currently contributing to the Australian 2021 State of Environment Report. John's articles, photographs and videos have appeared in numerous books, displays, newspapers and TV shows, and he publishes frequently on his website and social media. I'll put the reference to the book and the website in the chat as we go along for a bit of good promotion and, and interest. John volunteers as a regular surveyor, trainer and East Coast coordinator for Reef Life Survey, as president of the New South Wales branch of the Australian Marine Science Association and on a number of other citizen science programs, including Sea Slab Census and Sea Dragon Search. John's an active MPA member, having served on the executive and as a president. So welcome, John. Thank you for your time this afternoon and over to you to take us on a virtual journey of exploration of the hidden habitats of underwater Sydney. Thank you, Anne-Marie, uh, and thank you, NPA, for inviting me uh, to give this talk. So at the moment, you should be able to see my screen saying connecting with nature. If that's not the case, tell me in the chat. <laughs> Um, so yes, I'm very excited to give this talk. It's certainly uh, a, a passion of mine, the incredible marine life that we have in Sydney. And underneath all of that, one of the key reasons why our marine life is so diverse in Sydney is um, the selection of habitats that we have. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey. Uh, I haven't been in the water for a couple of months now, thanks to COVID. So this is the closest I can get. Hopefully uh, some of you are able to get closer than me, but if you're not, then here's your salt water fix. I saw, I think I saw Margot make a comment to that uh, extent in the, com in the comments. Um, so um, here we have uh, a picture of one of the habitats we're going to cover, the sponge gardens. Um, pretty much all the slides in this talk uh, I've taken in the Sydney region. 
So I'm going to cover four things. Uh, first of all, the characteristics of Sydney that make for its incredibly diverse marine life. And uh, a tip, um, those characteristics don't include the Harbour Bridge or the Opera House. Um, there's more to it than that. Then I'm going to go through some of the key habitats. And um, this is helped in a way by the book um, that Anne-Marie mentioned that we wrote on Underwater Sydney, because we arranged the chapters of that book into the habitats of the, of the Sydney region. So uh, a number of those chapters um, reference uh, nicely to what I'm covering. I'm then going to give some awards. Uh, the Marine Life receives the awards not you guys and girls. Uh, so no chocolates or anything, but the Marine Life uh, gets a few awards of my, of my giving. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about conservation and some of the conservation challenges that we have. So what makes Sydney and its Marine Life so special? Uh, this is a photo off uh, Shark Point, off Pavelli, and you can see the look on the diver's face. I like that uh, dive colleague of mine. He's going, okay, is that a look of endearment on the face of this blue grover? Um, anyway, that's the sort of moment that you can have uh, just off the shore here in Sydney. Um, so the first characteristic that makes for the incredible marine life that we have is the history of Sydney's as a region. It's a drowned river valley. So it's it's not, it hasn't always been um, a harbour. It hasn't always been above, oh, sorry, below water. In fact, 10,000 years ago, the shoreline was about 20 kilometres to the east. So what is now Sydney Harbour was about 70 metres above sea level and was basically a river valley. And then over the years 10,000 to about six and a half thousand years ago, sea levels rose to what they are today. And of course, the indigenous people had lived in this area for multiples of 10,000 years prior to it becoming a harbour. And another way of thinking of it is the 13 um, islands that we have in the harbour used to be just hilltops. To me, another incredible part of the story for Sydney Harbour is that Indigenous history. And I have a couple of these aren't my pictures. One's from Visit Sydney Australia and others, and others from this blog, um, Indigenous blog. Um, this one here shows the tribes, the Gadigal, uh, all the mobs, the Kamaraigal, Wangal, uh, as part of that, the Eora Nation that, that lived um, in, in the region. Uh, I'm presenting from the Wallamedigal, uh, area which is um, sort of northwest and here's a picture um, of the harbour before uh, it was changed by European settlement. So I think just knowing that there's that amazing history that predates our view of the harbour and recognising that the Indigenous people were living in the region when it wasn't a harbour um, to me gives a real depth to uh, the importance of the region. And the other thing that's interesting is, of course, a lot of the fish and other animals in the region had indigenous names. So what we call Ludric was Maramera. What we call Brim was Karauma. Snapper was Wallamai. And Flathell was Murray Nagal. So it's just, to me, I just wanted to take a moment to reflect on that and recognize that um, part of the storyline starts long before we started giving names to things, and that includes headlands um, and other parts of the harbour as well. So that's the Drowned River Valley part of the story. Uh, the next part of the story as to why Sydney is so special in its underwater environment is that it's built on Hawkesbury sandstone. So uh, because it was a Drowned River Valley, there's a lot of sedimentary rock, and that sedimentary rock, sandstone, erodes and as you can see here from this aerial shot it breaks up and every crack every boulder every nook and cranny you can see in this shot is potential habitat so the complexity of habitat that it comes from it being based on a sandstone structure that erodes in this way and creates the sandstone boulders and the crevices and cracks uh, also 
uh, lends itself to the diversity that we have because it has so many different places for animals and plants to take a hold. And, and most species uh, prefer certain types of habitats, certain depths, certain levels of wave action, temperature. And so having such a complex substrate creates opportunities for many more species than if we had just the one type of substrate. And so that means that we've got more than twice the number of fish species that have been found in Sydney Harbour than the entire coastline of the United Kingdom. And really that's not surprising because of this complexity. What, of course, the coastline of the United Kingdom has, it's got lots of biomass, lots of fish, it's just they don't have the diversity that we have in Sydney Harbour. And if you look at the others, birds, mammals and reptiles, that's the number of species in the Sydney region. So the number of bird species is about 370 and the number of mammals and reptile species less than 100. So that puts that 600 into perspective. The third reason why the marine life of Sydney is so diverse is we've got a highway coming down from the tropics and depositing species on our doorstep. And that highway is the East Australian Current. And what that means, we've got temperate species, species that like the cooler waters naturally um, evolving in our area. And then we get a surge of tropical recruits um, as the year progresses each year. Um, it comes in typically in summer, but we get the tropical recruits all year round. And that's not just fish, that's in invertebrates, even corals, as we'll see a bit later. And so those recruits then settle and often they don't survive the winter. But if they do survive the winter and multiple organisms survive the winter, they might even establish a population in this region. And so we have a wonderful blend of temperate and subtropical species in the Sydney region, thanks to the East Australian current. And it's not like it looks in Finding Nemo. It's not, um, you know, 10 metres across, but it does move incredibly quickly. It moves up to seven kilometres an hour, which is too fast for you to swim against if you are out in the midst of it. Uh, it's about 100 kilometres wide, this body of water that flows down the coast, and on average 1.5 kilometres deep. So it's a serious amount of water that's travelling south down the East Australian Current. And so we have the, the East Australian com current coming down. We have species settling. Perhaps they don't want to go any further south because it's too cold for them. And so over uh, evolutionary time scales, those species then um, get small changes in their genetics and they might even turn into a new species. And so we have a large number of locally endemic species. Here on the screen, there are two. So on the left is a soft coral called Dendronephia australis, um, only found in the region, really Port Stephens through the Jervis Bay is sort of the main area where it lives. And on the right is the red-toed anglerfish, uh, also called the Bear Island anglerfish. And it was only described in 2014, um, scientifically described in 2014. Uh, you can see it's black, black eye and you can see it's a little red fishing rod. Uh, here on where it, it has its lure to lure its prey. In total, in the Sydney catchment, so this is on land and in the water, there are three threatened ecological communities, 62 threatened species, 29 migratory species, and 48 marine protected species. So that's an incredible uh, diversity of unique or locally endemic species. So there's some of the reasons why the marine life in Sydney is so diverse and so unique. Let's now look at some of the key habitats. And here are just four, uh, but we'll go through them uh, and more than four actually, but four look nice on the slide. So the first one is seagrass. And you can see its habitat here for uh, sepia plangon, the morning cuttlefish. Uh, you can tell that sepia plangon because it has this bluish tinge around its eye. 
uh, and also it's living in seagrass. It's, it's really the main one that lives in seagrass. But of course, there are many species that like to live in seagrass, including seahorses, um, various nudibranchs, um, tube anemones. And seagrass is, is um, its habitat for other species, but also, of course, it's its own organism. And it's a true plant, so it has flowers and seeds and a vascular system, just like plants on land. But unfortunately, like so many of the habitats we're going to talk about today, uh, it is also in trouble. So we've lost around Australia about a quarter of the seagrass uh, that predated European arrival times um, since the arrival of Europeans, about a quarter has gone. And that includes the Sydney region. Um, seagrass is quite sensitive to water quality, sedimentation, um, heavy rain events, uh, and so uh, it can be affected by those things. Uh, and it's also on the plus side, it's very important for carbon storage. It, around 10% of the world's blue carbon is stored in seagrasses. So that one habitat, uh, very important ecologically, very important in terms of the world's climate, um, but also under threat. The second habitat I'm gonna talk about is just good old sand. Uh, of course, this is eroded sandstone. But a lot of organisms live inside the sand, uh, in between the sand particles. So tiny organisms living in amongst the sand crevices. But as you can see in this shot, also megafauna. Um, so big things live in the sand. This is a fiddler raid, it's hiding in the sand. You can see its head is bottom left of the picture, its nostrils and its um, eyes. And then you can see the tail going up to the top right of the image. A lot of rays live in the sand, of course. And sand uh, feels stable when you're at the beach. You feel, okay, this is our beach. This is what it always looks like. But sand shifts, of course. And so one of the threats to sand environments is climate change. Because as uh, the climate becomes warmer and extreme events become more frequent and more severe, um, that's going to change currents and water flows and it will change where the sand is distributed. The next habitat to cover off is our underwater forest, kelp forest. Uh, not many people photograph kelp. I really like photographing kelp. I think the colours are incredible. You've got the beautiful pink calcareous encrusting algae at the bottom. There just happens to be a turban snail right in the middle, which I only just noticed. <laughs> uh, and then you have the lovely brown, the golden honey color of the kelp. And of course the greens and blues as the water, um, the light is um, affected by the water as it comes down. So kelp, kelp forests are our underwater forests. Uh, they're not as tall, of course, as trees, but they perform a similar ecological function. So they provide shelter, they provide food, their habitat for many organisms. And they are one of the most threatened of the habitats because kelp likes cool water and it likes nutrient rich water because it, even though you can see these root like structures at the bottom, they're called holdfasts. They don't act as roots, they don't draw nutrients up, they just glue the kelp plant to the rock. So the kelp get their nutrients from the water. And so if the water is too warm, or if the nutrient levels in the water are low, then effectively the kelp, it's like it's being an impoverished soil and it, and, it, and it weakens it and then eventually can be lost. And unfortunately, tropical water is warmer and lower in nutrients. So as we have the climate changing, the EAC is getting stronger and water volumes coming from the tropics are, are increasing. Uh, that is putting the kelp under threat. And in fact, we're losing kelp and the, the macro, the big macrocystis kelp forests from Tasmania. In some regions of Tasmania, 95% of those forests are gone. In Sydney, we're okay with kelp, but in the 70s, we lost all of the crayweed in Sydney, which is another big brown algae. We believe that was due to pollution. Um, but we've addressed the pollution issues to a large extent with the offshore, uh, with the deep ocean outfalls and so on. So now the threat is not so much pollution, the threat is much more to do with climate change. Now the other thing that happens with kelp is 
it's it's typically uh, threatened by ecological processes too. So herbivores eating it basically. And in the tropics, some of the main herbivores are uh, herbivorous fish. So as they come south, the kelp's not used to herbivorous fish of that type being in the region. And so it, it suffers from her the herbivory pressure of those tropical fish. Uh, and also urchins, which are endemic to the area. But we've removed most of the predators of urchins by fishing, big fish and big lobsters. So by removing the urchin predators, the urchins go, woohoo, I've got nothing to eat me, so I'm going to have a boom. And so the boom in urchins then threatens the kelp. And we're certainly seeing that uh, in southern latitudes. And in Tasmania, for example, is really now, the kelp forests are already weak, um, are now even more threatened by urchins coming from the mainland. And so you can see a transformation. This is a lovely, healthy kelp forest. This is what uh, it looks like after a big storms come through, um, ripped out some of the kelp. Normally the kelp would have grown back, but it's weak, the kelp is weakened. The urchins move in and what might have been just a clearing event that was temporary turns into a conversion or a, a change of the phase from kelp forest to urchin barren. And you see this single kelp plant here, um, not only is it the only one left, and you can see all the urchins lined up here, you can see that they hide in cracks during the day and at night they march down here and eat as far as they can get and then they go back again. It looks to me like this is about the extent of how far they can travel in a night before they get down and there's a little bit more algal cover at the bottom of the picture because they can't get that far in one night. The other thing you can see um, on the kelp plant is a white bryozoan that's growing on it, um, which is also um, weakening the plant. Now we have a lot of urchin barrens in Sydney. Uh, they're a natural feature and the black centrist Stephanus urchin is a natural part of our environment. It's just the numbers of them um, are higher than the system normally has. And so this is just to show you how extensive the barrens are. Um, these are the photo quadrants that we take when we do a survey. So I do reef life surveys uh, in the Sydney region. As part of that, we photograph the substrate uh, 20 points along a 50 metre transect. And you can see in this transect, the first shot's my computer, so I know uh, where I started. And you can see every shot is urchin barren. And that also provides opportunities for tropical recruits to establish. So this is just off Manly, and all the green here um, are corals. And they're subtropical corals called Postolopora aliceae, and they're establishing themselves now, as you can see, in quite a large field of coral um, just off Manly. And if you look at the bare rock here, this is all urchin barren, of course, and you can see a few black urchins in there that have made that bare rock. Um, that provides an opportunity for the coral to establish itself because typically coral and kelp squabble over space. And so when the kelp is cleared by the urchins, it gives the coral a chance. Now that's not to say that coral uh, is new to Sydney. In fact, there's about 16 or 18 species of hard coral that uh, are known to live in Sydney. You can see the top right one is uh, the Apostolopera uh, alicea, which is a new arrival, but all the other photos are hard coral species that have lived in Sydney for a long time. But they're typically not reef building. They don't form those big reefs. They just live in solitary lives. They might encrust some rock like the green coral here, bottom uh, second from the left, um, but typically they're more solitary. So you can see the one top second from the left is a solitary clump of coral. And we also have lots of soft corals in Sydney. Uh, I mentioned the Dendronephia australis over on the right. You can see these lovely sea fans. You can see the Karajoa middle bottom row, the sea pen bottom right. So some beautiful soft coral structures as well in Sydney. And of course, these are all habitat for species as well because some species live in the Dendronephia. Up in Port Stephens, for example, seahorses live in the Dendronephia. Uh, 
in Sydney, we've seen more um, ovulids. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> little sea snails uh, living in it. Um, but uh, yeah, so we already have a great diversity of corals. Uh, it's just there are probably more coming. But my personal favourite habitat are the sponge gardens. These are just four shots, four different sponge gardens, typically off the heads of Sydney Harbour or just inside the heads of Botany Bay. You get these wonderful, diverse paddocks of sessile invertebrates. They're not all sponges, of course. So you've got ascidians down the bottom right. You've got um, octocorals, the carajoa, the whites uh, down in the bottom right. You've got the soft corals bottom left, the purple colours are soft corals. Uh, so they are largely sponges, but there's a whole bunch of other sessile invertebrates living in amongst them. And they are threatened by typically water quality, but also mechanical damage, things like anchoring damage um, to the sponge gardens. And they're also really important feed for many organisms. So one, organ, one type of organism that is able to eat sponges because sponges defend themselves chemically and also physically. They have uh, like little glass shards inside them to, to, to dissuade um, predators. Uh, nudibranchs, however, can sidestep their natural defences. And so here are four pictures of nudibranchs feeding on either sponges or bryozoans. See this top left one uh, is an Okenia feeding on a bryozoan. The top right in, is a philodesmia, and that the curly, pinky blob is a nudibranch, and it's feeding on the carajoa, which is the orange and white um, sessile invertebrate there. Bottom left is a Tasmanian nudibranch feeding on its one pink sponge. You always find them on that one sponge. And bottom right is a, a confused pair of nudibranchs, two different species trying to mate but they're living on their feed coral, which is a grey coral uh, sponge, <laughs> grey sponge. So a couple more habitats. Uh, of course, the rock pools, beautiful um, rock pools around Sydney, thanks to the sandstone. And the nice thing about rock pools, of course, is they're accessible to people who aren't on scuba and who aren't even uh, wearing swimming costumes. Uh, so lovely diversity, lots of different types of algae and rock pools, lots of mollusks and crustaceans. Uh, and so they're, you know, they're a great place to visit with kids. Uh, it's a very harsh environment. So anything that lives in a rock pool has the greatest of respect from me <laughs> because it's, you know, the range of temperatures they have to deal with, they can get up to 35, 40 degrees on a really hot day uh, and the water temperatures may be 20. So the rate, they, might, they might have to go through a 15 to 20 degree change in temperature in the one uh, shift from incoming to outgoing tide. An incredible um, harshness for a marine organism to survive in those, in those conditions, but they do. And the final habitat, uh, no, second last habitat I wanna mention is mangroves and salt marshes. Um, often historically not valued, you know, we tended to clear them and pave them turn them into development areas for housing, but they're really important ecologically. Uh, ironically, a lot of them were cleared so that we could put in flood prevention measures and so on along rivers. But what we're now finding is that by putting in hard shorelines, it, it doesn't slow water flow when we do have a flood. And so we end up with a, a worse flood scenario on when we have big floods. So there's a move around the world to bring back and re establish and, and um, repair mangrove and salt marsh that have been lost over the years. A very important habitat. And the final one is the artificial structure. So as we put in pylons and seawalls, we create an environment that is not naturally there. So it's not, not normal for the marine environment to have large areas that are heavily shaded with vertical surfaces that are flat. Uh, and if you think about a shaded flat surface that is vertical or even inverted, that's what a ship's hull looks like. So invasive species which move around the world often on ships' hulls really like these habitats because they naturally favour that habitat. That's why they're growing on the ship. And then they get to Sydney and then they tend to 
benefit from the presence of piers and jetties and pylons and things. So these artificial structures are magnets for invasive species uh, arriving on our shores. They also can be incredibly diverse. So it's a great place to go diving and look for interesting marine life, um, but it is a challenge for us. In fact, I can see a couple of invasive species already on that shot. Those sort of cheesy um, pale colored clumps are an invasive ascidian. The crab is native. Okay, so it's time for some marine life awards. Who is going to win? First award, the most successful fish. So I'm defining the most successful fish as the fish that we see on the most surveys, reef life surveys. It's not the most abundant because if we see one on a survey and one on another survey, that's two. Um, as opposed to 100 and 100, that's still, we've seen them on two surveys. So it's not the one that's in the highest number, but it's the one that's the most widespread. And the nominees are the white ear palmer, the eastern hula fish, and the crimson banded rats. So these are the top three that we see on the most surveys. Who do you think has won of these three? Now, if this was a live talk, I get you to vote. I can't do that. So I'll just tell you the winner. The winner is the most successful fish, drum roll, the Eastern Hula fish. We record Eastern Hula fish on 96% of our transects. And on average, we record 170 fish on every transect. So a very successful little fish, this one. It's the winner of the most successful fish. Now, Second prize goes to the most successful invertebrate, mobile macroinvertebrate. So we're not counting corals and sponges. These are invertebrates that move. The three nominees are the long spine urchin, the black one, the pencil slate urchin that looks like an underwater mine and the tent shell. Who do you think has won? You probably know from my previous discussion, the winner is, the black long spine urchin. This is the one that likes to eat kelp and is expanding its range. It's recorded on 90% of our transects. On, on average, we record 210 urchins on each transect. That's 50 meter tape, two meters wide. So that's 210 urchins for every 100 square meters. That's a lot of urchins. You can see here how they scrape the rock. Uh, I think this curved rock formation is actually the, uh, it's actually bio erosion. It's years and years of the urchins moving out at night, scraping the rock of algae and rounding it off. And you can see the little homes they've made for themselves. So to me, this is an urchin made rock structure. The most melancholy fish. This is one that my daughters used to say, oh, he looks so sad. The most melancholy fish award goes to, what's a sad looking fish? Seahorse, white seahorse. Of course, they're not often white. They're named after the ship surgeon on the, I think, first fleet. This is a male. You can see it's a male because you can see its brood pouch, which is tucked underneath. Uh, the sort of darker gray is the brood pouch. If you look closely, you can see the opening of the pouch. And of course, the males are the ones that inc incubate the eggs. This is on the nets, probably at Clifton Gardens. Uh, but it's, it's melancholy, but it also knows how to party because it changes colours. So it has a disco uh, theme going on. These are four pictures of the one species, all white seahorses. And you can see how they generally adopt the colour scheme of their background. So the top left one is on a brown sort of dark algae background and so it's quite dark top right is on an, uh, uh, a lighter colored algae background with some ascidians that are um, yellowy colored so it's yellowy colored bottom left is a pair of white seahorses on a pink sponge pink and then bottom right um, you can see a white color so clever enough to change color to suit their background um, but perhaps sad, at least 
in an anthropocentric view of the world. Now, the most colorful fish, a lot of um, contestants vying for this prize, but I'm going to give this to a local, um, not some tropical uh, ring in that's come down on the East Australian current. I'm going to give this one to the Eastern Blue Devil Fish. I think these are beautiful fish. They like the deeper water. It's not, it's still shallow. It's, you know, 15, 20, uh, down 50 odd metres. Um, but they live in caves, typically in ledges. But when you put the light on them, they really come up iridescent blue. And the other nice thing about the Eastern Blue Devil Fish is it's much prettier than the Western Blue Devil Fish. So if we have a debate with our Western friends from WA, uh, we can say we've got the better looking devil fish because theirs doesn't have the stripes nor does it have the yellow fin. The most intelligent local. I think some of you will know this one. You'll be able to pick it. Most intelligent local I give to the gloomy octopus. It's the local octopus that's uh, most abundant. Octopus have the highest brain to body ratio of any invertebrate on the planet. Their brain to body ratio is similar to that of a, of a domestic dog. Uh, and obviously re they're regarded to be very intelligent animals. Um, they have nine brains. So their brain is distributed a bit in each of the eight arms and then a bit in the head. And you can see that when you watch them because you can tell that the arms have the ability to make their own decisions. You can see an arm come out and feel this and then another arm goes over and does something else. And you can see to some extent, the arms are able to coordinate their own actions. But there's also a degree of central control because then when they swim, for example, all the arms are centrally controlled. Quite incredible. And they, they also can use tools. So here you can see uh, an octopus that's gathered a whole bunch of uh, shells. They like to do shell collection. Um, and here's one that's holding some leaves above itself to hide itself. So that's a form of tool use in a way because it's holding, it's using an object to serve its purposes. The best invisibility cloak. I'm going to give this award to the uh, sepia mestis, the red cuttlefish. And that's because it can change color a bit like the you saw with the um, seahorse, but on steroids. With seahorses, you don't see them change before your eyes. This cuttlefish can change in a matter of a second uh, as it moves from one substrate to the next. So these are four photographs of the same species, but just different colors as it moves from one background to another. The I'm happiest to see you fish prize goes to the blue groper, of course. They uh, love to come up to you, check you out. They're probably hoping you'll turn over an urchin for them. Of course we don't, um, but perhaps others have before. And so they're, they're probably after a bit of a feed, but they're also very curious uh, and you know, growing to over a meter long, they're also not afraid of you. Uh, so they're the fish that I think always seems happiest to see us when we're out there. Second last prize goes to It's Hardest to Believe You Fish. And this is uh, a real live dragon on earth. It just happens to be underwater. So the weedy sea dragon, a couple of nice, well-established colonies uh, near the entrance to Botany Bay. And here you can see a male. Not only does it look like a dragon, it's got the snout and the fins and the wings and so on. But uh, being a male um, sea dragon, it also um, does the parenting job looking after the eggs, which are all stuck on the underside of its tail. Now, the most endangered, I can't answer this scientifically, but certainly the pink corals that we have in Sydney uh, really um, seem to be one of the most endangered animals that we have. Uh, we had quite a nice colony that we were monitoring off the back of Bear Island for a number of years. And then a couple of years ago, it just almost fully disappeared. And they're starting to grow back, but 
nothing like this big one here, which the diver is just behind. So whether it is the most endangered, I'll give it the award for that, just because um, I like them and we're monitoring them. <laughs> um, but it's certainly uh, a really cool um, inver uh, sessile invertebrate that maybe won't be around in a few years time. So on that note, just the last part of uh, my presentation is about conservation. Um, we could have dedicated a lot more of the talk to that, but really, uh, to me, a big part of conservation is just appreciating what's out there. And so a large part of what I do with Marine Explorer and online, you know, social media and so on, is really about tr trying to show people our incredible marine life. Because in order to conserve something, you have to care about it. And in order to care about it, you, you have to know about it. So I think that's one of the first steps. But in terms of addressing conservation, uh, just a couple of slides on this. The first part of addressing conservation is say, well, what are the threats? What are the pressures? And the five big pressures on our marine environment are fishing pressure, or basically extracting organisms from the environment, climate change, habitat change, pollution, and invasive species. And the top three are really bigger than the other two. Uh, depends on which academic paper you read because it changes over time. You know, 10 years ago, climate change wouldn't have been seen as the biggest threat. So a number of the ranking attempts, at, you know, what are the biggest threats? How do we order them? Um, in the last few years, pr prior to the last few years have been putting fishing pressure at the top. Um, it's starting to look more like climate change is gonna swap places. But I think you still have habitat change next. So that's typically changing to shorelines, um, removing of intertidal areas and so on. And then you have pollution, the invasive species. Pollution is lower now because we've done a much better job of cleaning up um, our runoff in recent years. And some of those you can address locally. So you can look at fishing regulations, protected areas. You can look at pollution. They're local things even habitat change, but climate change is one that is a much bigger story than what we can address locally. So that sort of leads to the question, you know, what you can do, what as a person can I do to help with conservation of our local marine life? I'd say the first thing is get wet. Um, in the research that I've done on stewardship, one of the best predictors of the degree of stewardship of a person is the fact they just get in the water with a mask on and actually see it for themselves. So encourage your kids, encourage your friends um, to see for themselves what's out there. And that's a really important first step. It's easy, it's, it's fun, and it leads to better conservation outcomes. Get out in nature, and in this case, get out in the water. And then share, tell people, put things online, share with your friends, advocate, become a voice for marine life because it doesn't have a voice of its own. You can then start to get involved in much more active attempts to do cleanups. There's so many cleanups programs you can join up for to restore um, the condition of our marine environment. And the next one would be if you, if you want to take another step, do like we do with Reef Life Survey uh, in terms of um, gathering data. One of the big problems the marine environment has is it's pretty much out of sight, out of mind. And there's just not enough money to collect enough data to be able to track the trends in what's happening. And if you can't show something is declining, it's very hard to get conservation attention put on it. For example, things declared as a threatened species. So the more people that are prepared to collect data to help do surveys or take photos or record what they've seen, then the more chance we have of conserving our marine life. In terms of climate change, of course, we all know this one, check your consumption, you know, your use of fuel, your use of plastics and so on, uh, very important in terms of impact on the marine environment. And the final one is we know that protected areas are the best option when it comes to conserving biodiversity. There isn't any alternative that is better than a protected area particularly a fully protected area. So support marine protected areas because they're the best tool we have to conserve the, 
conserve the biodiversity of the ocean. So just a couple of wrap up slides. I'd love you to join me online. Uh, I try to post regularly on social media. My posts tend to be, hey, here's a cool fish, um, or here are six crab species from Sydney. So they tend to be informative. Um, it's sort of my personal attempt to, to make a difference. So I'd love it if you don't already, uh, you know, follow me or at least subscribe to some of those feeds um, and, uh, you know, share them with people and help spread the word. Tell people what's out there in our incredible marine life. You can join the Marine Explorers Forum on Facebook uh, and put your own photos and your own comments in. Uh, and also, um, you could visit my visit, my photo libraries. I've got about 11,000 photos now. They're all Creative Commons, able to be shared. So if you're ever looking for a photo for something, uh, so long as you say, hey, the photo's by this guy, um, you're free to download it and use it and share it. And uh, I'd love you to buy the book that I wrote with Inca Faulkner uh, on Underwater Sydney. So that's the other thing that you can do if you want to go next step and my that's pretty much it from me so um, i'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, i'm going to unshare my screen now and hand back to Anne marie okay well thank you john that was fascinating and um please then through some questions. We've got a few here which have come through, which is great. Just on the um, book and the website, those details are actually in the chat. So go and have a look there. I'm sure they'll, um, they'll eventually be up on the NPA website when this presentation gets loaded. John, we've had it, you, you touched on threats, um, but we've had some other thoughts come through on that. One of them is around the climate change issue and what that might do to the East Australia current, which you did touch on briefly, but you might like to expand a little bit on that, which also brings in the issue of, of um, freeloaders coming from the northern areas. Yes. Yes. And also offshore sand mining, if there's anything around okay. that which could be impacting. Okay, so neither are my areas of expertise, but I'll give you what I think uh, from what I've read. Um, certainly climate change is strengthening the, it's, it's putting energy into the system. So currents are getting stronger. Uh, and so what it's doing to the EAC is it's increasing the strength and volume of flow, but also the water that's coming down is warmer. Um, so it's a double whammy. Uh, we've got more water coming down and it's more tropical. And so the southeastern ocean area off, off Australia, off, off the southeast coast of Australia, that area of ocean is a hotspot. It's a climate change hotspot. We're getting more change there than we're seeing in a lot of other parts of the world. So climate change is going to just exacerbate that problem. We've always had tropical recruits coming down, but they haven't survived the winter. They haven't established themselves. They haven't started to build a reef effectively, like you see with the Postal Opera Elysiae. In terms of um, offshore sand mining, I really don't know anything about that other than any form of mining, any form of extraction is going to have significant environmental impact. And often the impact is greater than the local area. So you get plumes of contaminants that then flow on the currents as the sediments have been disturbed. The poor water quality downstream of the mining area then would have its own impacts. And so uh, whilst I don't know anything about what's happening there, I would say that the environmental impacts would be really important to get on top of. Thank you. And just on, the, there was a question about have the numbers of subtropical recruits declined over the last decade. Presumably that thought was from the issues that the northern areas particularly the reef itself have had with global warming, but I'm assuming that you're suggesting the numbers have actually increased because of that yeah, well, East Australia I, current issue. I, I don't have data that I can think of on that, um, but, but I think what is happening is they're more likely to survive the winter mm -hmm. um, because basically what happens when the water cools, they slow down and they get eaten. So it doesn't, the cool water doesn't kill them, it just makes them more of a target. 
So if it doesn't cool as much, then they're likely to evade predators more than they used to. So uh, I think it's fair to say there are a number of studies that show that tropicalization, so the amount or the success of establishment of tropical species is increasing. And it's, it's what they call at the leading end, edge of the range of the species. So a fish might have used to have its range down to say Port Stephens, well that edge is now moving south and eventually it will go past Sydney and then it will be established in Sydney. Okay, there we go for those interested in our subtropical friends. A um, couple of quick questions. How many species of seahorses occur in, in Sydney Harbour? Uh, well, the main one is the white seahorse. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have Hippocampus abdominalis, the big belly seahorse uh, in Sydney Harbour. And we never used to get, well, in fact, I saw them about 10 years ago and then they sort of dropped off and now they're back again, certainly at Clifton Gardens. There's one or two nice ones that have been there for a while. And then we have the pipe horses. Um, so the pygmy pipe horse, which you get more in Botany Bay but it's like a blend between a pipefish and a seahorse. So they're the three that sort of come to mind. And of course, the other big signated is the uh, weedy sea dragon. But you've got actually a bit more diversity in the pipefish than in the seahorses. So the difference there is the pipefish is, it doesn't have the curled overhead. It's more like a snake appearance. And there's quite a few species of pipefish in Sydney. There's the tiger, uh, pipefish tigris and there's cinctus and there are a couple of others so in terms of that group of animals signated there's um, quite a few species okay and in terms of um, getting involved you suggested jumping in the water which i fully support that idea um, especially with summer coming so what would you where's the best place around sydney to snorkel or dive in and this particular question refers to night time but maybe daytime <laughs> as well i don't know how many recruits we'd have for night time I, I, I wish i was i wish i was more adventurous and got out for more night dives because you get a different you get a changing of the guard when it mm. goes to night time uh, different species come out uh, look i had my own personal favorites uh, so my personal favorites the really the one of the best uh, really the only reasonable size fully protected area that is marine um, in Sydney is around Cabbage Tree Bay, so Shelley Beach and Ferry Bow. That's always fantastic because you get uh, two to five times the biomass of fish, 50% higher biodiversity because it's a protected area. And that's good for snorkeling and swimming, uh, snorkeling and scuba, sorry. Um, as a diver, Clifton Gardens is a great place because, you know, I said, how artificial structures are magnets for invasives. Um, they also, um, you know, you get a different mix of organisms as a result of that. So for critters, I like Clifton Gardens. Um, for just a mix of different species, particularly invertebrates, I like Bear Island. That's got some of the best sponge gardens. And then I like down at Cornell, the steps, because that's where you've got the most chance of seeing where you see dragon. Mm -hmm. Okay. And someone interested in the in when we're let out of lockdown and we go back to restaurants. How are Sydney rock oysters going? Now that I don't know. They they had a they had a threat from a virus. Uh, I I don't know what's happening. I'm not much of a fan of oysters, so I don't. I couldn't. You're probably better off uh, looking in the local paper or the latest uh, you know fishing uh, story on that one. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, we're we're sort of coming close to time, but. There was one query which hasn't come up in the chat, but in discussions about this session, there was a query raised about what happens to all these critters, fish, etc., when we get these huge storms and big seas. Where do they go? Yeah, well, look, some some get killed um, because they can't can't avoid the wave action. But of course, wave action is worse at the surface, and so one thing they do is they recruit they retreat to deeper waters. Um, if they can't move fast enough or they get caught out, then that's why you get, you know, the odd weedy sea dragon washed up on a beach. Um, but if, if they're able to move, then they move deeper. If they're unable to move, and remember a lot of marine organisms are cemented to the rock, 
kelp and sponges and so on, then they just get smashed. But they're used to that. Okay, so they might get smashed. I mean, storms came and smashed the kelp around Bear Island a couple of years ago. It was like just stumps, but it started to come back. The trouble is if you've got multiple pressures, so you've got that plus water quality, plus urchin, urchins in high numbers because they don't have predators anymore. And so what used to be, oh, the kelp got smashed, but it's growing back has then maybe turned into a bit of a disaster. So, um, so they typically go deeper, but the other strategy is, of course, um, most marine organisms have uh, ocean or a uh, water column phase. So they've got spores or they've got larvae or they've got eggs. And so they survive that process. And then the babies come and recruit and find a place on, hey, now there's some clear rock. I've got somewhere. So there is uh, a theory in ecology called, um, I can't remember his name, but it's about intermediate disturbance that says, if you get no disturbance, so no big storms, or if you get too much disturbance, both of those actually end up with lower biodiversity. The most biodiversity is if you get the middle ground, a bit of disturbance that the organisms can handle because it clears a bit of space and it lets some new recruits in and then things change. So I think with climate change, what we're seeing is we might be moving away from that nice intermediate level of disturbance into a bit more disturbance. So that might then result in lower biodiversity. Okay, well, I think we're, we're just, about, just about done, but thank you very much for that. And thank you to everyone who forwarded questions. Um, so I'm sure everyone on the call will join me in thanking you, John, for your great photos and your knowledge and put forward in a very enjoyable way. So thank you. I'd like to thank you, Anne-Marie and NPA for putting on uh, such a great event, um, close to 70 people. So, and thank you everyone for attending. Hope you go and uh, spread the love. <laughs> Tell everyone about our amazing marine life. Go and buy a snorkel. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, just a reminder, you can catch up on webinars that are they're put up on the National Parks Association of New South Wales website. Next week, we have an introduction to nature photography with Gary Dunnett. More details will be on the website and you can also register on the website. And I think that's, that's all from us. Um, we look forward to you joining us at our subsequent presentations and there's plenty more in the planning. Keep thinking up ideas and have a great rest of the day and evening. Get out there and paddle in the sea if you can. Thank you all. Bye-bye.